All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, Molly Krauss is our speaker today for the Adaptation Working Group webinar. Um, she is the Climate Change Adaptation Coordinator for the Wildlife Conservation Society. And um, today she's going to be talking about um, lessons learned from um, projects that were supported by the Wildlife Conservation Society Climate Adaptation Fund. Um, so, Molly, when you're ready, you can just get going. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Jill, and to the working groups for inviting me to come and present today. And as Jill mentioned, I'm going to be sharing some of my perspectives and some of what I'm seeing in the world of sort of on-the-ground implementation of adaptation projects that are designed to benefit wildlife and ecosystems. And I'm um, going to be sort of sharing, I'll be sort of describing the portfolio of projects that WCS is either involved in or that we are supporting through the grant program. And then I'll also try to extract what some of the key messages or interesting lessons or ideas are that, that I see coming out of that work. And I want to emphasize that this is very much a work in progress. Um, I'll describe it in a minute. but. I, you know, welcome ideas and suggestions on other ways that we might try to characterize this portfolio or suggestions on um, things we might explore with, as we sort of delve into analyzing this body of adaptation work that, um, that we sort of have access to and information on. And over the course of the presentation, I'm going to be drawing upon the two main resources, if you will, the adaptation work that I'm involved in. Uh, the first, let me, there we go. The first is uh, in my position as the coordinator of the Climate Adaptation Program and WCS's North America Program, I'm directly involved in working with partners within WCS and external to WCS and a couple of key landscapes across North America in on-the-ground adaptation work. And so those are the green blobs on this map here. Uh, we do a lot of work in the Adirondacks and in the Northern Appalachians, in uh, Ontario's Northern Boreal. Uh, most relevant to the folks here on this call today might be the work that we do in the Northern Rockies and around Greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Crown of the Continent. We also work in the Northern Boreal Mountains up in the Yukon and have a, a transboundary program in Arctic Beringia that covers Arctic Russia, Alaska, and Canada. So I have the privilege of getting to work with scientists and practitioners in each of these landscapes on actual adaptation work. And my colleague, Erica Rowland, who's on the call today, and I work very closely with our colleagues in these landscapes to help to support the science on the impacts of climate change facing particular wildlife and ecosystems in these places. And um, the work that Erica and I especially do is focusing on adaptation planning and helping folks design their conservation projects in the face of that climate information. So a little bit of what I'll talk about today comes from our experiences in working in these landscapes. And I'll sprinkle in a few examples of, of projects that we have underway, um, in particular from this Northern Rockies region. But primarily, I'm going to be talking about this very large and growing portfolio of projects that we are actually investing in and funding through the WCS Climate Adaptation Fund, which is a partnership we have with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, where over the last five years, they've given us roughly $2 million per year to regrant through a competitive regrant um, process, uh, regrant funds to conservation organizations that are implementing on the ground climate adaptation strategies for wildlife and ecosystems. Um, I, you all note that the website for the program is listed on this slide, and, and um, you can go there to, to get more information if you're interested. But what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about, again, the projects that we're seeing as part of this grant program, the work that we're doing in priority landscapes across North America. And I'll start by describing the portfolio, and then I'll transition to talking about what are some of the interesting ideas or lessons or messages that we see coming out of that um, work. So the Climate Adaptation Fund is, again, investing in on-the-ground adaptation projects, just here, focused here in the United States. And so we do not support climate science research. We don't support adaptation planning. But we do support the on-the-ground implementation of conservation actions that are designed in the face of the best available climate science. And, you know, going, having sort of seen folks take that science information and go through a planning process to determine what kinds of projects are really important to consider as they, um, as, you know, in the face of climate change. 
So again, we're investing in the on the ground piece. And, and really the, the intent of the program all along has been to try to catalyze adaptation implementation. Since over the years, as, as I'm sure um, many of us have seen, there's been a big investment in climate science research, a growing investment in adaptation planning, but still the implementation work has generally been lagging. And so really the impetus for this grant program was to try to catalyze some of that on the ground implementation. Over the last five years, we've given out over $10 million in grants to support over 50 different projects around the United States. And so, you know, over the years, as, we've, as our portfolio has grown, we've very intentionally invested in the creation of a diverse portfolio of real-world examples of adaptation implementation. And I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the, the fact that this is an explicit investment, but also that sort of what this diverse portfolio is looking like. Now that we're five years into the grant program, I mean, it used to be in the first couple of years I could, you know, rattle off all the projects that we were supporting. We now have a large enough number where it is both difficult for me to wrap my head around them all at the same time, personally, uh, but it's also kind of seems like a timely point in our, in our grant, the evolution of our grant program, to step back and really look at what are we investing in? What do these 50 projects represent? And are there some key messaging um, or key ideas that this portfolio of projects can offer to conservation practitioners around the U.S. and perhaps beyond as they embark in thinking about climate change in their conservation work? So, you know, again, our intent with trying to step back and begin to analyze this portfolio um, is sort of to serve two main functions. One is it allows us to help target our future investments. As I mentioned, it's a very explicit investment strategy of ours to create a diverse portfolio of projects that can speak to a diverse set of, adaptation, of conservation practitioners. So we will be using the analysis of the portfolio internally because it helps us think about, you know, again, where our investments have gone to date and where we might want to target for future investments. But the other sort of intent of stepping back and analyzing the portfolio is for us to be able to extract some of these lessons or key ideas and messages for the broader conservation community. So as I dive into talking a little bit about the portfolio, I just want to emphasize a couple of things. One is that today I'm just going to be talking about the 41 projects that were awarded grants between 2011 and 2014. That's because we just made the most recent round of decisions this fall on the 2015 projects. So now we do have a portfolio of over 50 projects, but I haven't yet analyzed the new projects in the same way that I've analyzed the previously funded grants. So I'll just be talking about 40 projects today. And I want to emphasize as I go forward and show some of the different ways I'm categorizing the projects in terms of the geographies where they take place, the ecosystem types that they're working in, the kinds of climate issues that they address. Um, I just want to emphasize again that this is a work in progress. And so I am still sort of finalizing some of the categories and how I define them, and, and also how I think individual projects fit into those categories. So, you know, don't be surprised if you see future iterations of this presentation or, or documents that come out of this work that, where the numbers are a little different. Um, like I said, it is a work in progress, and that's one of the reasons why, I, again, I, I really appreciate feedback and ideas and suggestions as I go forward. Um, I also acknowledge that there is some subjectivity to how I categorize the projects. And that, you know, my, my analysis I'll be showing is based largely on my interpretation of the project based on their proposals. And I also just want to emphasize that projects can fit into more than one category on the next couple slides I'm going to show. Um, and so that's why the totals might add up to more than 41. So again, my, my intent now is to just sort of provide a couple of little snapshots that just help to describe the portfolio of projects. And then I'll transition into what might be maybe the real need of the presentation, which is, you know, what kinds of key messages or ideas are coming out of this work. So starting with geographic distribution, I've broken down the U.S. into a couple of different regions. And as you can tell, the portfolio touches on quite a number of those regions. So we are beginning to see some pretty good geographic spread, although you will note some um, you know, areas where we have much greater representation and areas where we have uh, many fewer projects represented. Um, most notable, of course, is Alaska, where we don't have currently any projects that have been funded in Alaska. 
um, Hawaii and New England, at least as of the, the analysis I've done here, have very few representatives. Um, there were actually a couple of grants that we just made in 2015 in New England, so that number will tick up a little bit. Um, and there are areas like the Mid-Atlantic region and the West, the Southwest, the Northwest, and California, where um, we see some pretty you know, heavy representation of adaptation projects. So again, this is information that we take into account as we think about our grant investments that we make each year. And um, it's also a, a way, we've also used this information to help us target uh, adaptation coaching sessions and training so that we can try to help um, boost the um, number of adaptation projects, or at least the capacity of the conservation groups in these regions, like say the Southeast and New England and other areas where, um, where again, we haven't had great uh, representation in our portfolio to date, so that we can hopefully try to help build capacity in those areas. In terms of looking at the ecosystem types that are addressed in, or that where the different projects are taking place, um, again, you'll see, you know, quite a good diversity of ecosystem types, but some skewed uh, representation of a few. Um, at the top of this list, we have sort of coastal systems of increasing salinity, or rather decreasing salinity as you go from the top down. Um, then we transition to sort of more inland wet systems and river systems, riparian areas and deserts, and then a, a variety of different kinds of sort of terrestrial ecosystem types. This is one place where, in particular, we're still fiddling a little bit with the categories. But again, as you can see, we're starting to see representations in our portfolio of lots and lots of different ecosystem types. Um, but there are some that are particularly highly represented. And you'll see, can you guys see my pointer when I move my mouse, or is that invisible to everybody else but me? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. So we see that, you know, in, you know, wet areas, wetlands, springs, playas, vernal pools, river systems, riparian systems, um, and, and not surprisingly, there are a number of projects that are sort of working in you know, multiple systems. These are all kind of closely related systems, but we have a lot of projects that are uh, addressing those sort of wetland, um, riverine, and, and riparian habitats which may not be surprising when you look at the next slide, which is looking at the climate change impacts or issues that are being tackled in these projects. And this is one where there's a lot more, say, I guess, skewness than we might like to have in terms of having a more balanced portfolio. You can see a lot of projects that we are funding to date have been focused on addressing issues related to warming and drying and drought, and of course, closely related impacts on hydrology. So again, that may be a reason why some of the ecosystem types that we see most represented in our portfolio are those river, wetland, riparian systems. Um, there's also a number of projects that are think, you know, dealing with in changes in climate suitability. So thinking about ecosystems and their reliance on a sort of particular optimal climate conditions and as those conditions change, thinking about how uh, species composition may change within a given place or looking ahead to if that place is no longer going to be suitable for a target set of species, where might their sort of future habitats or future suitable climate be found um, down the road. So again, we see, you know, some impacts are pretty, you know, well represented, but we have quite a number of impacts up near the top of this list where we have you know, very little or no representation. Um, it somewhat surprises me given that there is a lot of science looking at phenological changes and because phenological impacts of climate change are um, fairly observable and systems can be fairly sensitive in their phenology, uh, it's somewhat surprising to me that we have not received very many proposals along those lines, certainly haven't funded any. Um, and there's other topics too that, again, are less well represented. And the one I want to flag in particular for your attention is this first one, looking at human responses to climate change and how changes in human land use or behavior or activities could influence the conservation of wildlife and ecosystems. Um, you know, that's a, it's a, it happens to be a soapbox issue of a close colleague of mine at WCS, James Watson, who's published a bit on this topic, where he's arguing that as conservation community, we are more heavily focused on these relatively direct impacts on conservation targets, whereas the biggest threat might be how humans respond to climate change both in terms of how humans adapt to the impacts of climate change and also try to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. 
and how those could have impacts on our conservation goals and outcomes. So that's one in particular where, you know, we would love to see more projects that are addressing some of these impacts that are less well re represented in our portfolio. So all of those, you know, those are just a couple of the ways that we're trying to categorize the project, start to get a feel for what investments we've made to date, and like I said, how we might think about future investments. Because again, we really want to try to have ultimately a, a diverse portfolio of projects where there's sort of something in it for everybody in the sense that if you're working in a given geography or a particular ecosystem type or you're tackling a particular climate change challenge, we hope that there would be some, if not multiple, examples of other people who are actually tackling those same issues in those same places and moving adaptation forward. So again, that's just a little bit of a description of the portfolio, but I want to move on to talking a little bit about how we're trying to extract interesting ideas and lessons and, and key messages from these projects. And as I go forward with this, I'll emphasize that um, you know, in some ways, the key messages or, or the quote unquote good ideas that I may be talking about in the next several slides are not necessarily new in and of themselves. But what, what our portfolio offers are real world, on the ground examples of those concepts and strategies actually being moving, moving forward into implementation. So, you know, we may talk conceptually about how increasing connectivity can be a really important strategy for uh, helping species respond to the effects of climate change. But what our portfolio offers are some real tangible on the ground projects that are really trying to make that concept and that strategy a reality on the ground. And so, um, so that in some ways may be the biggest value of, of this portfolio of stories and examples, not so much that they represent totally new ideas that nobody's talking about, but they do represent actual examples on the ground of trying to get this work going. So before I share some of those good ideas, um, first a few good caveats to the messages that I'll share in a minute. Um, again, just want to emphasize this is a work in progress. And so, um, so like I said, open to feedback. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. In fact, I, I took out a whole bunch of examples about a few good ideas for dealing with sea level rise, because I figured that's a topic that's less relevant to this Intermountain West audience. Um, but also because, you know, I don't necessarily claim to have extracted all of the quote unquote good ideas that might be embedded in this portfolio yet. So it's not an exhaustive list, but it's a starting point. And then I want to emphasize that when I say that something might be a good idea, I don't necessarily mean that it's definitively good, in that it's something that people should do or that they should do it everywhere at all times. But I would suggest that they are good, interesting ideas to consider and food for thought and maybe, you know, probing concepts um, or in some cases slightly more um, progressive thinking or maybe, I don't know, I, I don't want to say radical or revolutionary, but, you know, folks who are at the front edge of thinking about, say, facilitating change and, you know, ideas that may not be mainstream. So, you know, I just want to emphasize that, again, I'm not necessarily suggesting that these are, are definitively good, but I do think they are good ideas to consider. And then again, like I said, stay tuned for, for more, including ideas that I won't have time to talk about today, but that we're already starting to think about. So, all right, the number one good idea, which is probably the one that I'm closest to feeling comfortable saying is a definitively good idea, um, uh, the one to rule them all, if you will, for you Lord of the Rings fans out there. And, and that is that it really is a good idea to take climate change seriously and be really intentional about how you bring climate change into your work. And that's, you know, potentially preaching to the choir to this audience here who are all thinking a lot about adaptation and how we support practitioners in their efforts to think about climate change in their work. Um, but I say this, you know, not necessarily implying that everybody should care about climate change as their number one concern. That's not what this message is about. This message is about all of our work is likely to have, you know, some level of, of climate change could influence it in a variety of ways. And it really is important that we not just assume that what we're doing is going to be good in light of climate change, that we really look at the available information and ask some critical questions about whether we need to change what we're doing in order to be effective in the long run. Um, and um, 
you know, it means just kind of looking at that information and asking those tough questions. So we, we really, I mean, this is sort of the key, a key uh, this is sort of the, the sort of care, or I don't know what the right word is, but this is, we're trying to incentivize through our grant program, encouraging people to really be rigorous in their thinking and intentional in their thinking about climate change. We're sort of providing that carrot to encourage them to go through that thought process. And so we're asking them in our applications tough questions about sort of ha asking them to really clearly connect the dots between the climate science that they're considering and the climate impact information they're considering and how that information has influenced the design of their project goals and actions. So, you know, we ask them questions about what scientific information are you considering? You know, is it model-based information? Is it expert consultation? What we look closely at, you know, how localized the information is that they're drawing upon? Do they reference the global IPCC report or do they have access to and are they tapping into more localized expertise as well as empirical data and modeling data for their region? And we ask them questions about sort of their thought process. How do they really see that climate information influencing the design of their projects? Um, this, is the, this, is, this is the piece that's kind of hard to ask the right questions in a, in a written application. But we are asking them about how did you think about this work? What actions did you consider but decide not to take? Why do you think the actions you're proposing are the most important? How do you think those actions will play out and influence your, 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 your um, system in the face of projected climate changes? So that then we can ask them also questions about in what ways have their goals and the actual actions they're taking on the ground been influenced by that climate information. So again, we, we are really looking for practitioners to show us how they connect the dots between the science and their projects. Now, one of the ways, one of the easiest ways to gauge whether someone's quote unquote taking climate change seriously in their work is to, to have them express and ask them questions and, and, and hear their responses about what ways they might have changed or, or altered or adjusted their conservation work in the face of that climate information. So we, we are, you know, asking questions about what is maybe different about your conservation work because you thought about climate change. Or if it's not different, you know, how is it like particularly targeted and strategic about how it helps you address climate impacts? And this is, again, not to say that all conservation work should be solely oriented towards addressing climate impacts, but our grant program is intended to support those projects that are explicitly trying to address climate impacts as a, as a high priority issue. And there are a number of ways, I like to say there are a lot of different ways that your project can be different in light of climate change. And so here along the, the, the y-axis we see, you know, project might be different in terms of where it focuses its efforts because of climate information, what actions are being taken, um, why those actions are being taken, or what the goal is might be changing as we think about climate change. Uh, sense of the, the, you know, sense that this project is really more urgent because of thinking about climate change where the actions are of a higher priority. And, and so you can see that, that to date, and this is one that where it's, it's very subjective and it's hard for me to categorize these projects. So these numbers are a little bit fluid. But you can see that to date, most of the projects are sort of articulating that there's aspects of where and what they're doing that's a little bit different or informed, specifically informed by climate information. A uh, little, you know, a few projects that look at sort of changes in the why or the goal of what they're doing, a few related to urgent changes in urgency and priority. And then the other two categories that I would suspect could be out there, but we haven't found any or we haven't funded any yet, are, are projects that maybe, you know, how much might be different given climate change. How much of an action is needed to achieve our goal may be different as we think about climate change. And, and then also thinking sort of temporally about how we apply particular conservation strategies or actions, um, the when of a project may be different. So again, those are just sort of more conceptual ideas that we have, but we haven't seen any projects that specifically, I think, fit into those categories at least yet. So I wanted to just, this is where I want to start to transition to actually sharing some actual examples from the portfolio. I probably waited too long to do so, but uh, I want to sort of spend a lot of the rest of the project, uh, of, uh, sorry, my talk, um, highlighting points with very key examples from the portfolio. So I'm going to provide a couple of examples of projects that I see fitting into one of these three categories. 
changes in, in the where they're working, uh, changes to what they're doing, and changes in the sort of why of their work or the goal that they're striving for and how that's informed by climate change. So the first project comes from work that's being led by the Nature Conservancy in Montana. And, you know, with each of these projects, I won't be able to go into great detail, but this map that we're looking at is an analysis that they've done looking watershed by watershed at the different um, tributaries within the upper Missouri headwaters where they are sort of categorizing each watershed based on solar installation. So looking at sort of the geologic, or sorry, the, um, the physical settings of these watersheds, slope, aspect, um, and, and again, kind of integrating that to get at a sense of how much, how shaded they are in terms of their solar insulation values. And they're trying to target their work in these watersheds that are of a darker color, darker blue, because those are the ones that they suspect are going to retain late season snowpack for longer because of these sort of natural physical characteristics of those watersheds. So whereas before they used to target their work based on where native trout species are found, now with this project, they're targeting their stream restoration work in those watersheds that they suspect will retain late season snow for longer given climate change. And so again, an example of how the, the, the what they're doing, the stream restoration work they're doing is pretty similar to what they've done in the past. But what's different is where they're working. In terms of an example where the actual actions on the ground look different for uh, a project than, than what they might have been implementing traditionally, it comes from work at the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge on the East Coast in the Northeast. And this is a project led by the Conservation Fund working very closely with the Wildlife Refuge, where they are actively facilitating the inland migration of coastal ecosystems that are already beginning to experience the effects of, of inundation and, and, and negative effects from coastal storm surges as sea level has risen. So whereas in the past, the refuge never had to focus on the upland areas and thinking about, you know, planting, speed, planting particular vegetation and thinking about the hydro hydrology of those areas in terms of thinking them as, of them as future locations for coastal salt marshes, so this is a whole new type of activity that they're taking on to actually look at those areas and think about what actions they can take to help facilitate the migration of these coastal marshes further inland. So, you know, it's really changing what they're doing and, and a little bit of where they're focused on because they used to probably work in those core salt marshes themselves and now they're working a little bit further inland. And then lastly, just an example of how the why of a project or the goal of a project may shift because of thinking about climate change comes from a project that we're funding in the Sierra Nevada led by um, American Rivers. So they're doing headwater meadow restoration. And again, they're sort of taking these unhealthy degraded meadow systems and revitalizing the natural function to create these more healthy functioning meadow systems. Now that work in and of itself is not fundamentally different from what American Rivers has been focused on in the past. But in the past, they were really doing it for the direct wildlife habitat benefits that those restoration efforts provided. Whereas now, as they think about the potential uh, negative impact of warming on, on snowpacks in, in high elevations in the Sierra Nevada, as they expect to lose some of that high elevation snowpack water storage, they're looking at these projects because of their ability to increase what I like to call the sponge effect of these meadow systems. So they can slow down and store that water for release for ecosystem benefits later in the season as we lose the ability to store that water in snowpack. So again, it's an example of how the why of the work is changing, more so than what they're doing per se. So again, just a couple of examples of how projects are sort of adjusting in, in sometimes minor and sometimes more major ways in, in light of thinking about the effects of climate change. Um, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, my, my, I want to make sure that the message is clear that I'm not suggesting that a project has to be doing something differently in order for it to be adaptation. Um, I think it is totally valid for somebody to go through a rigorous climate adaptation planning process and after looking at climate information say, you know, what we've been doing and where we've been doing it is exactly what we need to be doing. 
And, and that's, in my mind, fine, and I would call that climate adaptation. But, um, like I said, it can be hard on the surface, especially as a reviewer reading a proposal, to really get a feel for to what extent have they asked those critical questions, or are they just assuming that what they've been doing and the places that they've been doing it are the right things to do or, or critical things to do going forward with climate change. So that's where, you know, it, we try really hard to ask the right questions on our applications. It continues to be hard, but I'm always trying to carve out space for somebody to say, we really took this into account, and we still decided that we should be doing the things we're doing in the places that we're doing it today. But now we can really draw clear links between taking these actions and our ability to achieve our goals in light of climate change. But that's a whole topic I would love to talk about more if people are interested in, because it is a challenge for the grant program, for sure. Okay, so I spent a lot of time on this, you know, good idea number one, but as you can tell, it's something that is near and dear to my heart in terms of encouraging people to really be intentional about their conservation work in light of climate change, and, and so obviously why I've emphasized it so much. Um, but I wanna also share a few good ideas coming out of the portfolio with respect to addressing particular climate-related challenges and impacts. And again, using real, the, sort of providing you with a sampling of some of the specific projects that we're funding. So I'll start with a topic that's, again, near and dear to a lot of our hearts here in the Intermountain West, a few good ideas for dealing with decreased water availability. This map is of uh, looking at historical snowpack changes over the last 50 years or so. As we all know, a lot of those trends have been declining, um, in some cases quite dramatically. And projections are in, for, in many places for more of, that, more of the same. So what are some of the interesting approaches that our uh, grantees are using to try to proactively address decreased water availability? Um, well, the first is what, one that I actually just mentioned a few minutes ago with the American Rivers Project, which is looking at ways to restore the natural water storage capacity of watersheds and ecosystems at least to partly offset or replace some of the loss of snowpack storage. So again, the, the wet meadow restoration work in, in the headwater systems that American Rivers is doing in the Sierra Nevada, is an example of a project I would put in this category. But the other one that, um, that I think is, is also both adorable and fun is efforts to restore beaver back on the landscape in places especially where they've been extirpated. So we've funded two projects over our history of our giving, um, one in southern Utah, led by the Grand Canyon Trust, and another in the Mutau Valley in eastern Washington, led by a collaborative group um, involving the Forest Service and some local uh, NGOs and other agencies in the Mutau Valley, where they're really, really doing impressive work to get a large number of beaver colonies back out on the landscape. <clears throat> And again, with the, with the goal of this work being to restore the ecological and hydrological functions that beaver have provided, that, that historically provided on these landscapes, in terms of creating wetlands, um, damming up ponds, um, recharging shallow and deeper aquifers through their, um, their beaver activity and, and the influences that those um, dams and other structures have on the hydrology to, again, create other parts of the landscape that are storing and returning water to the hydrological system later in the season as we lose that snowpack storage. Um, as an example of a project that WCS is directly involved in, so this is not part of our adaptation fund portfolio per se, but um, in places where beaver themselves may not be tolerated or where the system may be so degraded that it couldn't support a beaver colony, uh, we are actually going out and doing the work of beavers ourselves. This is my colleague, Jeff Burrell on the left, who is one of the best um, busy beavers I know. He is working with a, a woman who's the head of the Madison Valley Water Conservation District. And they're out there busy being beavers, um, planting these willow stakes and weaving willow branches in and out among those stakes to create these um, semi-permeable semi structures that are intended to mimic some of the functions of beaver uh, dams and beaver structures. So it's not trying to create a pond behind the dam. It's um, Jeff likes to call them, you know, I thought it was a good analogy, sort of speed bumps that are intended to slow those flows 
to um, build up sediments so we can reverse some of the um, incision that's happened in a lot of these stream systems, raise the water tables um, so that riparian vegetation can grow along the banks, and then start to bring in some of the natural meandering and other sort of dynamic functions of the stream. So a second idea for dealing with water, um, with, for dealing with decreased water availability is focused more on thinking about sort of changes in precipitation dynamics. Um, in some places, we might experience decreased precipitation overall or shifts in the seasonality. Um, and another projection that is common for a lot of places is that we may have the same amount of rain, but it might come in more intense downpours. So as we think about some strategies for dealing with changes in precipitation, we can look to projects like the one led by the Nature Conservancy in Colorado, which is uh, using rock structures to rehabilitate the hydrological function of these of um, brood rearing, of these riparian wet meadows that are important brood rearing habitat for sage grass. So you can see in the left-hand picture the structures that they've installed in these areas that, that used to be wetter meadows than they are today. They're a bit dried out. They have more of that kind of upland vegetation type rather than the wetland species that the sage grouse really like and, and need for their brood rearing habitat. But so you can see even just two years after installing these structures, a big, big both boost in the growth and productivity as the area has become more saturated during rain events. Um, and um, this picture, I don't know if that's Renee Rondo herself, but she's been leading a lot of the monitoring, the vegetation monitoring, and they have seen shifts from these sort of dry upland species types to these more wetland species types that are, again, moving the system in the direction that they, that they think will, will um, set this system up to be better able to deal with less frequent and, and maybe potentially overall decline in precipitation coming into the system. So when that precipitation does come, the system is functioning in a way that it can really soak up and maximize that precipitation when it's available. Another example of a project along these lines comes from work, again, that's not, it's not part of our CAF, our Climate Adaptation Fund portfolio, but it's a work that um, a rancher that I know in Montana, his name is Eric Kalska, over here on the, on the right-hand picture, talking with myself and another WCF colleague. Eric has been experimenting and, and kind of leading on his own research and experimentation on a variety of techniques for um, preparing his ranch for more arid conditions. And in particular, the two I'll highlight are the creation of these contour ridges. So this is a, a ditch followed by a mound um, that are carved out along the contours, the natural contours of the slope, so that when precipitation events do come into the system, and when they do come and they often run off as surface runoff events, these contours can um, collect that water and temporarily collect it and store it in a way that allows for percolation into the soil, greater um, benefits to plant, local plants, than would otherwise happen if you just had sheet flows that eroded the, the, the surface soil off instead. On the left-hand side, he also has been working in these dry gullies to install these simple little rock near dams, again, to trap some of the moisture when he does get heavy precipitation events. And he's seeing a lot of really interesting responses even in the first year or two after experimenting with some of these techniques. So moving on from the water focus, um, a few good ideas from the portfolio for coping with what, what I call for the sake of this talk, significant ecological changes. So big changes is kind of getting at that um, changes in climate suitability. So you know, changes in composition at a place. We're thinking about so where future suitable climates are going to be for, for a target species in the future. One of the ideas that come out of our portfolio for coping with these kinds of significant ecological changes is to, to actually play a role in shaping that change and taking actions that, that are actually designed to benefit those species that are expected to thrive under future climate conditions. So again, I would sort of place this more on the facilitating change, enabling transformation um, end of the spectrum of how somebody might want to approach dealing with climate impacts. In some cases, we might try to resist them. In other cases, such as the example from um, the North Minnesota's North Woods, we might try to actually want to shape and, and shape those changes. So this is a project led by the Nature Conservancy in Minnesota. 
where they're, they're working in systems that, that are regularly harvested, and there's a, there's a sort of traditional practice of replanting those forests after they're harvested. And in the past, they've replanted those harvests, those harvested areas, with species that have been dominant there in the past. But, there are, but climate models are suggesting that those species may not be um, suitable, or they may not find the future climate of this region suitable in the future. And there are other plant species, some of which are currently found in the area today but are relatively rare, that are projected to actually do better under the future climate conditions. And so the, the, the Nature Conservancy and their partners have decided that they really want to invest in keeping this system of forests rather than having the sort of current species decline and have the area replaced by either a shrub or grassland system. They want to maintain a forest because it's important to the local regional livelihoods and economies for recreation and sort of the cultural identity of the area. And so they've chosen to intervene by um, tinkering with the planting list that they're working with post-harvest. And they're bringing in more of those species that are projected to do well under future climate conditions. And they're not getting rid of, but they're de-emphasizing those species that are projected to, to really have a hard time persisting into the future. So again, it's, it's maybe in some ways a baby step towards shaping that transition, but I imagine it was one that could have significant consequences towards the area staying a forest. They're making sure there are species available that can thrive in those future conditions. Again, this is one of those examples that, like when I present on this to managers in Yellowstone National Park or other protected areas where intervention is much lighter or we're sort of not directly shaping um, ecosystems as much. Uh, I usually hear a lot of heartburn about these kinds of projects. But in this, you know, in this landscape where they are harvesting, these are managed, these are working for us, you know, people sometimes have a different reaction to these ideas. And then the last example is um, of, of sort of an approach for coping with significant ecological changes is, is a little bit of, you know, a little, a little bit of the flip side. The, the adaptation forestry project is looking ahead to climate projections, looking at who might be the winners and losers, and actually, you know, embracing and, and maybe shaping the change towards those winners. A, a very kind of different approach to acknowledging dramatic changes is to instead focus on protecting what people are calling the geophysical stage, recognizing that the players or the species acting on that stage um, may change with climate change, that if we have a diversity of stages that are well protected out there, then there will be stages on which different forms of biodiversity um, can act out in the future. And so, you know, we're trying to protect those stages and the regional connectivity between them so that as species shift, as climate changes, and species shift or seek out different climate conditions and what they're experiencing where they, where they are today, they have an ability to move because there's regional connectivity that's protected, and they have stages to find out there somewhere on the landscape. So this is kind of a little more of a bet hedging strategy. And um, one particular project that we're investing in that, that is sort of embracing this kind of an approach is um, led by the Nature Conservancy and the Central Appalachian. And so on the left here, and, and I don't have time to go into the details, but some of you may already be familiar with this resilient landscape analysis that Mark Anderson at TNC has conducted for the Northeast. And again, it's looking at places that um, and it kind of gives high value to places that have lots of topographic variability, so lots of different geophysical stages, and that are important to sort of regional scale connectivity between those stages. And so the Nature Conservancy uh, Central Appalachians Program is working in one of those areas that's seen as being really critical in terms of the stages it represents and the connectivity that it provides across the region. And they're focusing their um, restoration efforts on those places. So again, trying to, to not necessarily pick winners and losers, but focusing on these quote unquote resilient sites as Mark Anderson defines them and, and focusing conservation efforts there. So those are just a handful of, of some of the, the good ideas for dealing with a couple of key climate stressors that I think are particularly relevant out here in the Intermountain West. Um, like I said, there are more that we've already thought about that I didn't have time to share today related to sea level rise anybody wants to hear them, I can share them 
after I wrap up during the Q&A. Um, but like I said, there's also probably a lot more great ideas and interesting um, food for thought uh, concepts that's embedded in our portfolio that we're is, has yet, have yet to extract. So in terms of next steps, um, we're trying to find a variety of ways to try to share some of these examples and stories. Um, I should have had a photo here of our colleague, Catherine Dunning, who's the communications director for the Adaptation Fund program. She has been, um, she's been uh, creating film and audio pieces and um, other forms of visual and written sort of storyboarding that she's done and is going to be making available on our uh, website for the grant program. So that's sort of a work in progress. The videos are available already. There's five of them available on Vimeo if anyone wants to see those. And then, like I said, she's working on a kind of storytelling platform for our website where we can begin to share some of these stories and examples. And, and hopefully, I'm hoping it'll eventually be a place where there's some keyword searching that people could do and get a list of examples. And again, our, our intent with trying to share these examples are to provide practitioners with real-world examples of climate science and planning leading to on-the-ground implementation. Of, of adaptation strategies that are largely discussed in concept and actually showing how they might take place on the ground. While I, don't, I haven't had time to talk about it today, you know, we're also thinking a lot about how people monitor and test and evaluate the effectiveness of these projects, and that's sort of a whole other topic for conversation and another presentation, but um, that we can talk about that as well if people are interested in it. But for now, kind of also just talking about these ideas and food for thought, but showing how people are actually making them happen on the ground. So that, again, we hope that the, sharing these examples will help stimulate thinking and motivate action on climate adaptation, planning, and action. And we want to also see if there are ways we can roll up these examples to help inform broader policy and practice on adaptation. For example, within coastal systems, there's a big emphasis on looking at these green alternatives to protecting coastal systems and, and shorelines. Um, living shorelines are the, sort of the, the label a lot of these structures get. And, and so, you know, I think there are some real room for thinking about how there could be policies that are designed to either, you know, enable or maybe even favor some of these more ecosystem-friendly approaches to thinking about buffering coastal systems from the effects of climate change. So we want to think about ways we could maybe leverage this portfolio of stories to try to influence broader policy and practice. So our hope is that by you know, spending some time looking at the portfolio and extracting these ideas, we can then think about different ways to share and communicate those stories to have a bigger influence. So with that, I know I've gone on for quite a long time. Um, if people are able to stick around for a little bit, I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, receive suggestions and feedback on this work, because um, I really do appreciate input and ideas. So thanks very much. Want to jump in with a question? Sure, I have one. Um, you, you uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, this is Trevor Even at the uh, North Central Climate Science Center, and I just had a question about. Um, you mentioned that you're looking for human responses uh, projects, or, or would like to see more of those. Is there anything that comes to mind as an example of something that? I guess you guys would be looking for, maybe that wasn't funded by this project, but that you've seen. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see, I think I stuck in here a couple of things I had to cut. Let's see. So this is, this is the only example. You'll notice there was one project that was labeled under this category of human responses to climate change. This is the one project that I would characterize from our current portfolio as fitting in that category led by the National Wildlife Refuge Association. They do a lot of land conservation and easement work. And so this is in Peninsula, Florida, where obviously sea level rise is a big concern. But the area where they're working and they're trying to put conservation easements, are not, it's not necessarily an area that's like the most threatened by development today. It's areas that they're concerned will become hot spots of development as coastal areas become inundated and sea level rises and coast, there's a pressure for coastal populations to move inland. So this is an example of a change in the urgency. You know, this is like not maybe the most urgent place today to invest in conservation easements, but it is really critical, especially if we want to lock in those areas in the face of the sort of future threat of human development marching inland from the coastal areas as they become inundated. 
So that's one example of a project we are currently funding. Um, other projects that, um, that we've either heard about or have maybe come into the grant program but for a variety of reasons weren't the right fit at the right time, you know, looking at, say, agricultural changes in the Great Plains and the Northern Great Plains and, you know, as the sort of corn line marches west, as the climate perhaps becomes more suitable for, for new crops in those areas, thinking about what that means in terms of the threat or pressure on um, conservation of, of grassland systems or prairie potholes in that region, you know, that might be another example. Um, it, it could also be, again, those are kind of more on the maybe adaptation side, if you will, you know, humans adapting to future climate conditions. Um, I could also see projects related to more the mitigation side. So when we think about energy development, whether it's wind energy or biofuels and how, you know, humans are going to invest heavily in that and the consequences it has for wildlife habitat um, and, and ecosystem viability going forward. So those would just be a couple of examples. Does that um, help explain a little bit of some of the ideas I'm thinking about? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Else? Molly, this is Shannon. Thanks Hi. for the thanks for the presentation. That was great. I'm just curious um, if you've looked at any of the adaptation typology literature to think about how you're categorizing projects and themes and things. So um, I'm not sure I know exactly what you're referring to. I mean, we have another graph I pulled out. Here, we have looked at the projects in terms of these sort of general adaptation strategies. In terms of you know, so this is a this is a list of sort of general adaptation strategies that came from the Climate Smart Conservation Guide. There's other ways that people categorize these strategies. So we have started to look at you know which projects offer rep, op, offer examples of sort of taking that concept and, and applying it on the ground. You can see a little bit of the distribution here. This is another one where your definition of the categories is really, you know, it's hard to, there's a lot of overlap among these categories. It's hard to definitively define them, and it's hard to sometimes categorize the projects. But um, this is one way we've done it. But if you've got ideas on other typologies, um, I'd love to, to, you know, feel free to send those my way or share them right now, and because I'd love other ideas on how it might be useful to categorize these projects. Sure. Yeah. So, so what I was referring to is, you know, there's in the literature, there's sort of a a, a broader um, what could be called quote unquote adaptation typology literature. Um, a lot of it has come from looking at international projects. So, mm -hmm. on the, you know, on the global scale, a lot of the I was co-author on the paper on an adaptation typology paper where we were looking at adaptation projects funded by Jeff, the Global Environmental Facility, so, you know, mm -hmm. things that have spun out of the UNFCCC, et cetera. Um, and, you know, that's a lot broader in geographic and um, sector scope, but I mm -hmm. just suggest it as a possible place to look for, you know, sort of food for thought of how, you know, different people have thought about how you characterize different types of adaptation projects and and again this sort of difference that you pointed to which as you know we we talked about in the national climate assessment adaptation chapter which is you know um a lot of planning not so much implementation so anyway if you want to follow mm -hmm. up we can we can talk yeah about that i would i would love I, I would love for additional suggestions of the kind of different kinds of categories we might use i mean we have i have um <clears throat> analyzed the portfolio in terms of you know, is it sort of aiming towards resistance versus resilience or transformation? I have looked at the portfolio and started looking at, you know, is it about reducing vulnerabilities? Um, is it about, and, and is it about reducing sensitivity or exposure or, adapt, or increasing adaptive capacity? So there's some, some other ways I've broken down the portfolio that I haven't shown here today, but, um, but I'd love other specific ideas on sort of typologies I might use. So yeah, I'll follow up with you on that. Okay, sounds good. Great, thanks. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely want to encourage anyone who has other ideas along those lines or, or you know, it, you know, things like, oh, it'd be really great to know if you have any projects that are doing 
this or, you know, how many of your projects are involving what kinds of, you know, agencies or partners. Um, you know, if there's other kind of queries that people would want to make of this kind of information, please send those ideas my way because, like I said, you know, in part, it's, it's you know, I have some ideas, but um, I'd love to be able to use this data to answer other questions people might have. And, and you know, acknowledging that it is, you know, it's not, it's not a completely random sample. It's ones that are based on some particular review criteria that we've used to select the projects. Um, but just to kind of plant a seed as well for sort of, Stay tuned for more. We're also um, we have a, working with a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, a woman named um, Sarah Skickney, who is analyzing the pre-proposals that come into our grant program. And so those, in my mind, represent you know a, a little bit of a closer approximation of what people out there are are well, calling climate adaptation work or thinking about as adaptation work or or that they see as adaptation work. And so it might be, a, you know, again, not necessarily a purely random sample, but it's maybe a little bit more representative of sort of the state of where groups are at right now and thinking about these issues. And so I'm hoping that that will also provide some added context to then thinking about the portfolio of projects that, you know, we screened out for, for particular reasons and have chosen to fund, which is, which is a different kind of subset of the world that's out there. But, um, like I said, stay tuned for more. Please feel free to reach out to me with any additional questions you have about the work I'm doing or suggestions for how we might think about the portfolio. I'd greatly appreciate it. Sure. Okay, thanks, Molly. I think we're yeah. about out of time now. So I appreciate um, you taking the time to give the webinar today. Just one announcement. Um, next month's Adaptation Working Group webinar is going to be on February 9th. And Liz Shanahan from Montana is going to be talking about um, her survey of the importance and conservation of white bark pine. So um, stay tuned for the announcement um, on that. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Um,